Good afternoon, everybody, up in the uranium market in general. Uh, I'm Derek Brookperson, the uh, Vice President of Research here at Red Cloud, and, and with me on Daniel Major, CEO. Um, as as follows, I an update on, on Goviex. We'll provide, then Daniel and I will discuss the state of the uranium market and sort of what we're both hearing, and then we'll take questions live from the audience. So please send us your questions via the chat, and we'll get, get to as many as we can, we can in the time allotted. Uh, to start with, we'll handle the disclosures uh, to get that out of the way. For Goviex, uh, there may be some forward-looking statements made on the call. I would direct listeners to the cautionary note on page two of Goviex's corporate presentation uh, located on the company's website. For Red Cloud Securities, please see the full disclaimers and disclosures on our most recent Goviex note on our website. And I would highlight that this webinar is for information purposes only and should not be considered a solicitation to purchase or sell securities or a recommendation to buy or sell securities. And we note that this call does not take into account the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigations and seek their own professional advice before investment. Specific to specific to Goviex for Red Cloud, in the last 12 months, Goviex has been retained under a service or advisory agreement by Goviex. In the last 12 months, uh, Red Cloud has received compensation for investment banking services from Goviex, and Red Cloud, or a member of the Red Cloud team, has a long position of shares in Goviex. So with that out of the way, uh, we'll get ready to ha have Daniel speak. And I, I just want to highlight a couple of things of why we like Goviex and, and, and why I think it's a unique story in the uranium space. First, uh, unlike a, a lot of its peers, it's permitted with government support. So it's one of the few projects that's actually going to get built in the next cycle. Um, and the second is, is that uh, uniquely, it probably doesn't need to even remove the uranium price to be taken out. Uh, from what we've seen uh, in the Chinese activity in Africa already and, and purchasing projects, uh, they're focused on securing long-term supply and are a little more price agnostic than uh, some sort of uh, North American investors, and so that uh, that potential exists. So with that said, uh, without uh, say, get, getting into everything, I'll turn it over to Daniel and to talk about uh, Civics about GoVX. Thank you very much. Let me put the slide deck up for you. and. Uh... While we're on that, I'll just take myself off to make it easier. So apologies, it's started in the middle. Um, there we go. Let's get to the beginning of this thing. So I'm going to just give a brief overview. Many of you have seen this slide deck, um, but thank you for attending. Uh, much appreciated. And thank you, Derek, for your, for your intro there. Uh, this is our first webinar uh, with Red Cloud, and hopefully we plan to do many more in the future as we develop forward. Derek has already gone through um, the disclaimers and cautionary statements and you can find those on our website i'll provide you just a short overview i'm sure there'll be lots of questions and i think people prefer to to ask direct questions and hear me do the vanilla presentation um, we are very much focused on uh, the uranium sector uh, we are a development company we're focused on africa uh, we have a very large mineral resource uh, the key to us is really our two mine permitted projects we have considerable exploration upside and our real focus at this time is on the development of the Madawali uranium project in Niger we have always stated our focus to be on Africa uh, we like the jurisdictions within the continent where we are uh, and in most places you have you have your challenges but in general Africa is commodity rich, uh, with governments focused on the development of those commodities. Many countries now have long histories in mining and now have the local skills to access that wealth. Increasingly, we're finding as well the African countries that we deal with are becoming increasingly pragmatic on dealing with the mining companies that go forward. And obviously, we've highlighted that with our recent um, first stone laying with the Niger government. Uh, and even with the Zambian government now, where they've recently gone backwards on the tax changes that they were originally proposing. For brevity on this, I've actually only put just one slide in, and I'm sure we'll have a lot more conversation about the market. But I think this slide from the WNA fuel report pretty well encapsulates where we are in the market. We are predicting, and WNA is predicting, steady growth forward. Uh, this is the uh, reference um, slide that they produce. Steady growth forward on nuclear demand. Um, current production is not meeting that demand at all. Um, it's requiring restarts. It's requiring new projects to meet that increasingly widening gap going forward. But those restarts and those new projects need much higher prices. And I think 
that's something we'll come back to in our discussion because there seems to be a lot of mixed messages out there between what the utilities are looking at, what the producers are looking at, and certainly UXC Consulting's report out this morning on their survey is showing that where we're seeing good news on some areas, completely different approach on exactly the same information coming from elsewhere. GoVX strategy um, has always been to try and move forward with that market. Uh, we're very much looking at where that market starts to see a price impact come forward. And so our focus, because of our mining permits, has been getting our projects ready in a timely manner um, and appropriate use of capital to ensure that when we need to respond, we can re respond relatively quickly. And hence our focus, particularly on Matawela, where we've got a strong relationship with the government. In summary, Matawela is situated next to Comac and Somaya, Arano's two mines that have produced about 140,000 tons of uranium since the early 1970s and represent 60 to 70 percent of Niger's annual exports. We received the mining permit for this back in 2016. Um, and the shape of the mining permit has actually recently changed. And the slide that you've got on here now shows the new mining permit, which is now fully encapsulated the Miriam deposit, which is the deposit right on the southern border. And in addition, brought in the MSNE deposit, which is actually an underground deposit. That change in shape added about 24 million pounds of uranium to our mine permitted area and importantly increase the size of that open pit resource. The project has considerable infrastructure in place, uh, mainly due to the historical mining in the region. What it also has um, and what you can see all those black marks are actually all our drill holes has an ex substantial exploration upside. The current project is about 21 years of mine life. It's planned to produce about 2.7 million pounds per annum. Uh, with a startup capital of about $360 million and a cash cost of $24.5 a pound. We recently concluded um, a deal with the Nigerian government regards the incorporation of the Nigerian Mining Company, which has included the deferment of taxes for the next three years um, and eradicated existing expenditures that due, were due to the government in exchange for them getting a 10% shareholding in the company. That was about $14.5 million worth of value, so implied value for the project at about $145 million. But it shows the, the pragmatic approach from the government. They realize that the market is in a difficult place uh, and they want to see our project get developed. So our strategy there is very much continues to be focused on the feasibility study and the optimization of it, focused on lowering the operating and capital costs. These two drivers effectively influence all other aspects of the project financing, including the debt and the offtake side, because clearly the lower we can get the cost, the better we can be and the more flexible we can be with both the offtake and the debt. So we're making some big steps on that, and I'm sure we can get some discussion uh, around there. After Niger, uh, we have the Matanga project in Zambia. Again, a project well situated with great jurisdiction and good infrastructure. Uh, we know that Zambia has been through a number of uh, changes recently on taxation, but again, it has seen fit that it's taken the appropriate and uh, pragmatic approach of effectively reverting to where it was uh, because it relies so heavily, particularly on the copper industry. Uh, one small factor that didn't come out of this was that we originally, when we did Matanga, assumed a 9% royalty for this project. Uh, with the subsequent changes, and that was because it was an open pit, they got rid of the open pit uh, royalty and that were now classified as an energy mineral, which has a 5% royalty. So in future um, economic studies, we will be looking at changing that uh, royalty number for that project to the lower amount. Um, Matanga is a very simple project. It's an open pit heat leach. Uh, it has very low acid consumption. And, and that's a key factor relates very much to where we're targeting our strategy with Maduela as well. Um, acid is your major consumable in the production of uranium, unless you happen to be an alkali uh, leacher. But in the acid leach, guys, that is it. In the case of Maduela, it's currently 10 percent of our costs, much smaller here. So what you've got here is a project with an all in cost uh, very similar to Maduela. 
um, with a lot of expiration upside uh, between the existing deposits and a lot of potential to further optimize this one. Uh, we do, in addition, have the Falea project. I won't put a slide up for that one in Mali. Uh, this is about 30 million pounds of resource. Uh, it is a has a defined process design for it uh, that was done by the previous owners. And again, a lot of exploration upside. Uh, we actually are surrounded by gold projects and we actually have the Sibaya trend that I am gold have coming down onto our Madini license. Uh, so we are doing a little bit of work there at the moment on, on gold soil sampling to see if something can be made out of that. Um, we have a, a small team, uh, the technical team, as same as our corporate team. Uh, but we have a lot of experience and have been in this industry for a lo very long time. Uh, this slide's been around for a while, so I won't go into any depth. Um, in addition, similarly with the board that we have, we've combined the skills that we need. We have guys with a lot of experience in debt, in the case of uranium, uh, in mine development, uh, in West Africa, financial and legal background. So we have the board that we need to move these projects forward. And obviously through the Friedland family, access to places like the Far East, China, um, and their relationships. Um, yeah. We've removed the major debt that we're sitting on here. Uh, we, at the end of these, the second quarter results, we're sitting about two and a half million dollars. Uh, we still have uh, continued to agree the repayment terms uh, with Linkwood, um, and more importantly, resolved our issues with the Nigerian government. This slide to me is probably the most important one from a valuation point of view. Uh, it shows the producers on the left hand side and the developers on the right hand side. And that really is is the, the move that we're looking for. And we're one of the few at the moment that can make that move from being a developer to being a producer. Our strategy, again, very much trying to bring those costs down so we can move faster than everybody else. Uh, and that's where our, our real push is. Uh, we continue to work with a number of banks and other entities on financing um, and on aftertake, but really the feasibility study needs to be sorted out first because that will underpin the value we can derive from those other two areas. And then finally, back to the investment rationale, you know, this is a company that's really focused on development. We have a very large resource, but we've got a lot of exploration upside. We have those two mine permitted projects and we're really focused on getting Maduela up and running as a project um, as soon as the market will allow us to do that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Um, that's, uh, that's a great overview. Um, let's, uh, let's delve into sort of the, uh, the uranium market for a bit, and um, I guess you had the opportunity about a, about a month ago uh, to attend the WNA event and be in London for that. Um, maybe give us a couple of your impressions from that and some of your key takeaways and what you thought of that event. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, that fuel cycle report was probably the, the driving force of what was coming out of there. People were very bullish. Um, we had just come out of Section 232. That seemed to have been cleared away. Um, I think the key driver behind that fuel report was the people involved in it. It was seen to be very much more proper insiders were involved in putting that report together. People who knew what they were doing. It, um, it wasn't lopsided, which has been the case in others. The key aspect, which is why I use that slide, that even in the worst case scenario, it was showing a market in deficit and a demand for it. Um, the overriding from the nuclear side was nuclear is continuing to grow. We're expecting forward growth going forward. The mines came out, both Cameco and Kazatom from particularly very on message. Guys, you know, we're, we've cut back. This market's now in deficit. You're going to have to eat away at your inventories. Cameco were making the point that they still have to buy metal between now and the end of the year. And I'm sure you'll have a question about that one coming up in a minute. Um, but, you know, I, I, WNA was very positive. Uh, and I think, you know, that's where I'm finding at the moment, as I said, the UXC weekly came out today and they did another quarterly surveys. And I'm still finding, particularly on their messaging, um, they're a bit bipolar um, in what they're saying. Um, you know, on the one side, the, the market is understanding that they have it, there's not enough supply. Uh, they're having to draw down on inventory and that new mines will have to come through. And yes, the new mines or existing operations are there, 
but they're not listening to the fact the supply the utilities aren't that the existing operations need a much higher price to come back and i think that bit still has not sunk into the utilities yet uh, as we currently stand um and just on the cameco on you know cameco keep talking about the 12 million pounds plus they've got to buy at the end of this year i was talking to one of the uranium traders beginning of this week last week end of last week and just asking like is this real you know when are they coming and it was like well they're there but the volumes they're buying at the moment are really small um they're really not making a big hit at it um so i think we're still waiting for cameco to come into the market aggressively uh, and actually buy those pounds. Um, they really seem to be pounds that need to be bought, bought to cover contracts. Um, so I think that's still to come through. Uh, and I, I hate to say it, I still think the working group is just hanging over us for a little while longer uh, and is a little frustrating. Um, but the reality is I don't think anyone knows what that will do and I will avoid all questions on that one if I can. <laughs> the, uh, I, 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 well, I mean, I think that's the disconnect. I don't think there's a lot of disagreement on the supply and demand fundamentals is what's out there producing and what can come back online. I think if the the issue, the disconnect seems to be is what price supply comes back online. And I think that's, you know, I mean, the work that we've done say it suggests that it's north of 55. Um, and I think that's the, at, at the very least to get enough supply online. And if you look at, you know, and that number is probably conservative when you look at the WNA's demand, demand profile. Yeah. So, I think you know, and, and proper costing of projects, not just um, not just the you know what the all in is, but what you know what you have to generate to get a proper return for investors, whether they're debt or equity or, or uptake partners on it. So I tend yeah. to agree with that. That, that that short term trading thing is interesting because that's I think that's a big uh, gap. Part of the Macar big deal behind the MacArthur River shutdown was that Cameco was going to be filling demand out of the spot market. I think, and that you know, so that everyone said, oh, they're, they're coming, they're coming. And you know, it sounds like they're still coming, um, and so we haven't seen that benefit to the to the no, uh, no. spot price yet. And then, um, and I guess that uh, it really feeds into my next question is on long-term contracts. I mean, I what I've heard is there's only been one sort of uh, RFP out of the U.S. Um, since uh, since 232 ended um, on a long-term contract, and I don't think that got filled. So. Uh, or hasn't been announced what what the end result was. I don't know what um, uh, what you're hearing from traders, etc. That, that you talk to. I'm not hearing anything. I, I did ask this question on the long term contracts, and there's nothing. And and this is where I'm starting to get a, you know, this this mixed messaging that's coming through. UXE is saying, oh no, there's material there. When I talk to the traders, they're going, there isn't any material out there. We just cut. They're not covering their positions that they're trying to work with to find that material. Uh, and so that's where I'm finding the, the, the mixed message going through, which is the guys who are actually closing deals right. um, are saying the material's not there. I think the one other comment I would say that came out of um, w &A was Kaz Atomprom made an, an interesting comment, which really set where they're going to go, which is they will not restart until, until they have seen the tier one producers back into production. So this wasn't the case, uh, you know, they made it very clear that they are walking, you know, hip to jowl with Cameco on the message. Um, you know, before it was, oh, we can come back, we're very flexible, but he made it very clear that, you know, he will only look at bringing back the operations that are there when the tier one producers can be justified to be bad in production. And in other words, MacArthur River's got to be back. Uh, I mean, the... MacArthur River is probably one of the most, you know, valuable, even at these prices, probably most valuable per ton rock mines in the world. Um, and the fact that it's shut down says a lot about the state of the market. Um, but I think that's, and Chemical has been pretty clear. I think their price around $45 a pound is what they would even consider before uh, bringing MacArthur River back. So that gives you an idea how much the price has to move before the, the majors who, who are exerting discipline um, are. And I, and I would, that because I had a problem comment I'd echo, echo they had their uh, investor day in London uh, about a week yeah. ago I guess right and they they repeated that again that was they're they're very clear on their on their uh, on their market discipline and what they can do what they're capable of, of holding back now I don't think they can they can't cut anymore it's just cutting for longer because uh, out of prom but um, I don't think Cameco can cut anymore either because I don't think Cigar Lake's gonna shut down but I think between those two two guys if they keep it they keep supply where it is uh, in, the, in their capability um, yep. but it's going to react at some point. Um, so, uh, 
I guess the, and I know you're trying to avoid this question, but uh, I, I guess, what do you think, what do you expect out of the, uh, the working group next? I guess that's on, uh, that's on Thursday. The answer is not a, not a lot, probably, uh, is the answer. When it first got announced, I, I, my comment was, it's a tire kicking exercise. It's a can kicking exercise. We're just booting this down. Uh, I suppose, uh, the, you know, when I listen to some of the US guys, they talk about, you know, buying for the military, et cetera. And I'm like, okay, that sounds really clever, guys, but who gets the contract? <laughs> How are you going to spread this out? You know, five million pounds are needed to keep the the reactors running on the nuclear fleet that's out there. Well, great. Well, who gets that contract and how do you div divvy it up? Because, you know, if you happen to be a small producer and you only get a small, a very small contract, that's not enough to get you going because you're, uh, you know, your, your cost structure just doesn't handle it. You need enough to justify starting up properly or not start up at all. So I, I I don't think there's any clarity of where they come through um, from that, particularly for the producers themselves. Uh, I mean, I've heard the guys talking, um, but I don't think even the guys you, uh, you know, from UEC, their messaging has changed completely. You know, they don't sound as confident as they used to sound. You know, they're just hoping something comes out. Uh, and I don't think there's any clarity. I, I, I think probably for, for me, I think the biggest uh, the both biggest thing that can happen is that they don't kick the can down the road again, um, and that they put a pin in it, and then it gives certainty to the to the um, the uranium buyers at the uh, U.S. Uh, for the U.S. reactors to actually get go back in the market and start buying stuff. Um, I think that more than anything else, that's the thing with 232 as well, but it didn't. Uh, they kicked it down the road. I, and I can't even count on that with this this particular, um, with the current U.S. administration and trying to predict what they do is uh, um, a bit of a fool's errand. Uh, so, um, and I guess, uh, I guess on to the, the, the burning question probably most people have is, um, what do you think it's going to take to get the uranium price moving higher? Because obviously there's lots of good news. The supply demand numbers look good. The fundamentals suggest it should be going higher. Um, there's... Uh, it seems to be a push on, um, you know, a clean energy push that nuclear is starting to be talked about again as part of that, uh, as, as a clean energy source. Um, what do you think it actually takes to get this thing, to get the, the price to a level that uh, will uh, um, uh, get, get things going again? I don't think there will be a single catalyst anymore. I think it will, it will be buyers coming in aggressively for what they need. Uh, if you look at every year we've gone past, the fourth quarter has always been a good time for price. And I think momentum is going to be the driver um, of what comes here. I mean, Cameco do still have to come and buy. They also made a point that they have their Q1 to buy for yet as well. So that's not even included the 12 million they've got to get for this year. Right. So I think you still have that coming through. And I think that momentum driver is there. You know, there's a lot of talk about the carry trade. That's nothing more than the forward book you've always had out of the oil trade, but that will start to move that term contract. And once you see those spot prices pushing up aggressively, they will push forward that carry trade that's out there. Um, and guys will be forced to have to drive up the spot, the, the long-term contract price to go with it. So I, I think it ultimately will be a case of momentum. You're absolutely right. You know, the messaging's everywhere. Even the U.S., I mean, Perry is standing down this year, but the guy who's replacing him is another pro-nuclear guy. So, you know, the messaging is great. Uh, I, I can't see a particular catalyst because I don't think there is one. I think what you will see is, natural trading coming in if guy if the material is not there as i'm hearing from some of the traders then at some that means people are pulling their inventories down if they're pulling their but one point the traders did make and this is something i've always said as well is if you look at the forward book a lot of these guys are still covered you know they if they're getting their forward book coverage from their contracts they're okay still but those forward books come off fairly quickly you know and they are looking at two to three years so you know, that curve that, you know, I put out there and many other guys put out there of the forward, you know, um, covered position, that is starting to, to kick into play. Uh, those term contracts aren't coming through really. Once they suddenly realize that, hell, where am I going to get material two years from now? That's when you'll start to get very interesting. And you can't buy it all in the spot market. Yeah, I, I think that's I, I think that's it. I think that gap between supply and uncovered demand as that as that keep keeps widening uh, you can't have a supply deficit and uncovered demand uh, continuing to go up you're eventually 
that will come home to roost, right? But it's just a matter of yeah. it's a it's a matter of when, not if. I think that's our view, at least. Yeah. Um, uh, we got a, a before we we leave the uranium market. Um, the uh, I got one last question on. Uh, so if the working group doesn't resolve the issues, uh, you know, they kick the can down the road again. I guess. What do you think? Uh, what do you think happens? Um, and I think we get to. Okay. You're going, to do a, you're going to do a Brexit on it, are they? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, forever. Um, no, I, I think this is, not, I don't see why the working group would bother to go past this point. Um, yeah, there's no rationality to it. Um, I think they've gone out to find a, 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 a way around the process without doing what they're doing. Um, you know, there's a risk of suddenly penalizing, as Cameco, uh, Kazatom made the point, they now ship more to the US than they have ever shipped to the US. Um, so, you know, I don't see this one being pushed away. The fact that there's a very pro-nuclear government in place at the White House as well, um, I, I always think they will err on the side of the reactors in this. I uh, appreciate there's a defense side, but, you know, who's to say they don't just go out and buy material and store it? I mean, the amount that they're consuming every year at five million pounds, you know, I'm sure the US Treasury can afford to buy that amount. Um, given the current price that's out there, uh, and just store it away, um, and that would be, you know, a very strategic way of dealing with it. Um, you know, the best way to protect your materials is actually leave it in the ground anyway. Yeah. Okay. I, I think we've uh, uh, covered the, the uranium market sufficiently, and, and and we'll take we'll take more questions on that if they come up. But I think uh, um, we've got some questions on the line, so maybe we'll start with uh, uh, yeah. start with those. Um, so, in the presentation, you talked about sort of life of mine costs per pound. Um, what does the question is? Uh, does it include the original acquisition, or is it just uh, sort of construction capex through through production? No, it, it only includes the costs that are related to the project from this point onwards, because obviously that's what you're financing um, when you go out to do it. So you're looking at the, the 359 million is what it will now take to build um, the project from this point onwards uh, based on the PFS and the $24.5 uh, a pound is the operating cost of everything except for the royalties which are over on, over on top of that. And the reason we don't quote the royalties because they're linked to the price. So you'd have to keep stating what the price is that you're putting the royalty in at. And, and I think um, along those lines, uh, this next, we'll go to this next question. Um, you know, obviously the all-in costs for, for Manduela are one thing, but what is the cost that really makes, um, what is the, the per pound price that makes Goviex a, a sort of a going concern. You think you get a low enough? What price do you need on a long-term contract? If I showed up today to say, okay, we could build it, and we'll be yeah, a going yeah. concern. If you look at the PFS at the moment, it's just over 55 as it stands today. Um, and and then you could you you have to look at the debt structuring that goes with it because that's how you're you're justifying it. So what I have done is post W and A last year is to sit down with the technical guys and say, all right, you know, we've got a delay in the start of the market here. We have an opportunity to go back on this project um, and see what we can do um, to substantially change it. There were two facets to this really. One is, all right, you know, we have got to bring costs down the way it was designed. Um, and on top of that, we've got to cut our risk. What have we got in the project that is risky um, from a technology point of view or otherwise that we can take out of the project to reduce the, the banking risk as well. Because, you know, banks look at that from a technical perspective when they come and finance it. They will look at the technology you're applying. So if you look at the costs of Matawela, the major cost of mining and um, processing about 50-50. Uh, they're pretty much even. If you look at the total costs in all, about 10% of the cost of acid we consume vast quantities of acid. For every ton of rock, we're using about 80 kg a ton of rock. So there's a lot of acid uh, we have to put in to the ground. Uh, so we have to import 20 k, no, 30 kgs of sulfur for every ton of rock we're gonna put through. Um, so, and th that is driven by the amount of calcite, um, a lot of carbon, calcium carbonate in the ground. So 
that has been our single biggest driver is get rid of that acid consumption. And that's really where we've been focused. One of the ways of dealing with it was ablation. Uh, we were able to use ablation. Um, ablation is a relatively new technology, though. It is really straightforward. It's just smashing water currents, slurries into each other, and then screening off the fines. Uh, but what we've realized is that actually, by all the work that we did, we can actually just use gravity uh, instead. Um, one of the benefits of uranium is it's really, really heavy. Um, and it's a lot heavier than the... Um, the background rock so we're now doing a lot of test work which has been very positive and once i get you something i can present i will but that's showing that we can take out quite a lot of the mass but more importantly we can take down the calcite um volumes which will impact grade the other areas was we use solvent extraction um it's quite expensive um we've re there's some new a mines that are now available in the market for ix we we're able to go and use those they have completely simplified our wet process on the project. Now these will bring down our, our processing costs by a lot. We can look at contract mining, um, which was not possible when we did the PFS. Nobody wanted to go into Niger contract mining. Um, we've now got seven different companies quoting, uh, including two Nigerian companies um, quoting on contract mining. We had about $25 million of capital in for the mining fleet, uh, which obviously we can then take out. There will be an impact on OPEX, so we've got to figure out where they bid in. Um, but we're waiting for those proposals to come through. So there's a lot of areas, you know, we can go back with both the operating costs and the capital costs to, to cut down. Um, and then the other one is just a philosophy change. We built a PFS that was optimal for 21 years. Um, the bankable has to be optimal for seven. It has to pay down its debt. That's all that counts. Um, once it's up and running and generating cash, that's what we, that's what we're about. Um, I guess the, the, this kind of feeds well into the, the, the next question I'll ask here. Um, a question from the line, can you compare Manduela to Global Atomics DASA project also in, uh, in Niger? Um, yeah, they have higher grade cores. Um, they can get to higher grade material. We're very consistent. Our overall grades are the same as theirs. Um, they run a very high acid consumption. I mean, there's, as I saw in their PFS, about 120 to 150. Um, I know they were looking at a, a toll treat um, at a Comanac. Um, we did as well, um, but I wouldn't actually cut a contract with Comanac until I knew what it was gonna cost me because you gotta be able to compare the two. Um, Comanac, as we all know, is closing. Um, so they have to go to, you know, that's gonna be an issue uh, for whatever they do. Um, you know, DASA is an interesting project. I mean, it's, it's one benefit is the very high grade core in the center of it. Um, but you still got to get through all of the really low grade stuff at the top to get to it. Uh, and I understand that, you know, they are going to open pit it. Um, their grades are going to actually be lower than ours to start with, I believe. We'll, we'll wait and see what they put out as their PFS. But effectively, you know, for the first years to get into production, they have to go through relatively low grade to get to the really high grade that's at the bottom. So, you know, back to how I'm now looking at Maduela, which is to my guys, it doesn't matter if we've got an awesome 21 year mine life. If you can't get past the first seven years, you don't have a project at all. Right, yeah, if you can't pay, if you can't pay for the cap capital, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah. I guess the, uh, uh, moving from the, the projects onto some of the more, uh, a little bit onto the, the, the corporate side, a um, couple of questions, uh, and, and obviously uh, uh, you're, you'll be able to answer as you can. Uh, obviously, um, there was been there was a question on the line regarding any uh, any potential mergers or offers or things like that. Uh, maybe rephrase that is uh, um, what kind of uh, interest are you seeing in the space generally for uh, for uh, pre pre project pre development pre construction projects versus sort of uh, already producing mines. Generally, the one, yeah, no, that is something we have seen a big difference. I mean, when I was talking to uh, some of the the bigger nuclear project buyers um, who are out there, um, kind of twenty four months ago, they only wanted producing assets. That's all they wanted. Something that was already producing. Uh, don't talk to me if you don't have it. Uh, didn't care. Um, that has changed a lot. Um, now, um, guys are starting to realize that they've got to look at projects that are ready to be built and go for it. Um, they're very much more open to that conversation. 
Um, there is a, an increasing interest as well for projects that can get to production fairly quickly. Um, whereas before, you know, guys were happy with these high value projects and saying, oh, it's really good, but now we're realizing it's going to take us 10 years to get it into production. So maybe great, but it's going to be parked for a while. So that has changed. Um, you know, we obviously took, spend our time. I, I go and do, for example, one to one in Hong Kong coming up. So I always make a spin through to, to Beijing to go and do a run around there. Um, so, you know, we do keep it open. Um, there is the other side of this, which is the construction companies that we try and deal with. And I've mentioned before, you know, we've had conversations with Chinese construction companies, which are increasingly become aggressive to get involved in projects because they've got cash. Uh, and they need to use that cash as well. So there are other ways of looking at this, not just from the acquisition point of view, but you know the financing point of view that comes with it as well, uh, and the offtake. And when you talk to some of the big Chinese groups, you know they appreciate that they have got to supply a lot of uranium to that market. Um, you know they they're expecting a small amount, probably 10, 20 percent of their material to come from domestic. Um, they're looking at probably making that up to 50 percent in the market. And the rest they've got to have international assets to supply it. Um, and so they're actively looking for those international assets to come in and provide that feed through to them. Um, and that's their big problem is finding the projects to do it. It's an interesting part on, on, the, on, the, on the build side for the Chinese is that they're, uh, the most recent reactor they sold, I think, was into Argentina. And uh, that was came with a 60-year life-of-mind fuel supply agreement. Um, so they are all whatever they're building, they're trying to supply, and so that's the other that's the other part of it that uh, um, yeah. interesting. Yeah. On that theme of a, a Chinese construction company, uh, what the, the question is, what what does that kind of deal look like? Um, uh, when, I know answer, when I know what the answer is, I'll tell you the the final one. But no, what they're doing, you've got Chinese companies out there who have a lot of money because obviously they've done gone through a massive construction boom. Um, they're predominantly SOEs, uh, and what they're they are willing to come in and do the construction on the basis that they will are willing to look at providing the financing that goes with it. So effectively, they're making sure that they're busy um, and they're using their capital and then putting it back through again. So they're making money out of it. They're making sure that they're busy. But those companies do exist in China that have gone through a massive construction boom and now like are looking around going, well, what do we do now? We need we need big projects to go and go and work on. Um, and then uh, obviously uh, a question um, here is um, well, I, a difficult one. Will there be any upcoming equity raises to delay payments from Linkwood? Um, obviously, you are a pre-production company, and so uh, the you heard art generating revenue. So um, at some um, point, you will. Revenue, uh, unfortunately. Um, I mean, obviously, I can't answer that. We have our balance sheet. We work it as hard as we can. I keep my costs as low as I can. And at some point in the future, you know, with Linkwood repaying as well, we will need money. Um, you know, that's just a function of who we are. Uh, we're obviously looking at the debt market as well. It will depend on the uranium market. Um, if it suddenly runs, then we can also look at debt financing for feasibility studies. Those are out there. But until we actually have a very clear position on where that is, um, the timing will depend on the market. Um and then maybe talk a little bit about uh, uh, insider ownership. Uh, question on online, specifically about your your uh, your ownership as well. But uh... yeah, no, I get asked this one where often. I mean, I joined in 2012, so I, I I first had the chance of buying at 2.50. So I've been right a while since then. Um, I'm sitting with only about 60,000 shares at the moment. I've got a lot of options out there which I need to convert, and they're huge to start expiring from the year up the next. Okay. All right. Um, and I think uh, most of the questions that are left have been answered in the context of other questions uh, that we've done on the call. Um, and I guess, uh, obviously, because of the, those capital constraints, and I had one more question that I wanted to, to ask. Um, obviously, you've got uh, from Utanga and Falia. Um, are you doing any work there, or is those the focus on Mandawela and getting that ready for uh, a potential construction decision? Uh, the heavy focus is very much on Mandawela. I mean, in, any spare dollars go into Mandawela and uh, what we can do there. We obviously have to keep an eye on what we're doing with our other projects. If you don't, you could risk losing them. 
Right. Um, Matanga, because of the recent, you know, government mucking around with its taxation and whatever, um, we did tend to back off. We've maintained our CSR down there. Uh, and the government gives us a lot of support. There was a big southern province expo recently, which had the president at and the mines minister. And Govex was one of the prime videos that were put out. And I think you can see it on our Twitter feed out there, um, which is very much, you know, his Govex. Um, you know, we love it. It's part of where the southern province needs to go. We need it. And Zambia wants to go nuclear as well. It's one of the countries talking very much to Rosatom about going nuclear, so very strong there. Um, in Falea, we, we've just had all our licenses renewed, um, so we're right at the beginning again of all of the curves on that. Um, one of the problems of Falea from a uranium point of view is it, you have to drill quite deep to get to it, even though it's at the bottom of the plateau and you can walk into it. Because it's a flat-lying ore body, you've got to drill from the top through all of the dolerite and laterite. So what we are doing is doing some work on the gold um, that's around there. It's much lower cost. Um, you know, we may be able to do something with some of those gold properties and generate some value for that license while still retaining the, the upside on the uranium. Um, and then uh, uh, this is going to be the last question we're taking from the line, and then I'll, I have one more. But uh, uh, the, and framed appropriately, the million-dollar question, where do you see the spot uranium price by year's end? I'll, I'll answer as well after you do. By well, year end, there's, there's not a lot left of this year, so that gives me pretty... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, interestingly, I'll just tell you what UXC had today. UXC was ranging between 24 to 26 for the utilities, 27, 26 to 30 for the producers. That's what the producers are. And I think, you know, a $30 is probably pushing it in October, but it's still possible. Uh, I think we'll probably be under that by year end now, given where we are. Um, I think going into next year could get a lot more interesting um, still. I, I think there's, as I said at the beginning, you know, the problem with the utilities is once one little fishy swims, they'll all swim in the same direction and start to shoal. Um, and I say, as I say, you know, the utilities have made it very clear that, you know, they believe there's enough projects out there that can restart to meet their requirements. And this becomes my mixed message, which is they still think your utilities think uranium price then stays under 35 uh, for a couple of years. But, you know, Cameco has made it very clear they need over 50 to want to restart MacArthur River. And Kaz Atom Proms made it clear they don't restart, increase any production back above their level unless MacArthur River effectively restarts. So, you know, that's what it needs um, is a continued drawdown on these utilities, which they're doing. I mean, Every year, the utilities volumes are dropping off. Um, they've got to meet those requirements to meet those reactors. So uh, it's going to suddenly change, and then we'll all go, what the hell was the catalyst? And we'll figure it out, and it will have just run. Yeah, I, I guess the um, – I, I, I would take north of 30, but, I, you know, I think it's almost a binary outcome. I think we could be on our way to 40 or still at 25. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, so we have to do what we can to be ready for it. Yeah, exactly. So speaking of being ready for it, obviously you're doing some work on this. And then we'll wrap it up here. Uh, obviously you're doing some work on the feasibility study, uh, updating for yeah. a feasibility study and the project finance portion of it. Um, when do you expect to have some sort of uh, tangible announcements on either of those items? Um, on some of the technical stuff, I'm hoping to get those out in the early test work this year so you guys can see where we're going. Um, on the feasibility studies, I mean, people always assume there's a drop dead date for me on this. There's not. It's very much driven by the market. Uh, the reason for that is that when the banks take that feasibility study, they want it as updated as it is possible. If you finish it too early, they'll make you go back and recost it and redo it. So there's no point in spending the coin twice, uh, do it once and make it sure it's right. Uh, we make sure that the, the lending banks and the off takers are very much part of the ongoing discussion. And you know, this ties through, the lower you can get the cost, the more you can borrow against it. Um, and then you've got to look at the amount of offtake you want to take on that. You know, the lower the cost, the more offtake you can take out of the spot market, get rather than the contract market. And and you can look at the pricing structure. So it is a bit of an exponential, you know, conversation. You've got to look at the you know the simultaneous equation that goes with all of this, and 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 set, you know resolve it on all directions. But key is really get that feasibility study finished first. That's what we've focused on, and that can be done fairly quickly once we've decided on the, 
the big ticket items, which is I'm working on at the moment. And they're not costing me a lot to do either. That's good. Well, uh, thank you very much, Daniel. Appreciate the uh, the time today. And I hope and uh, thank you everyone for, for attending and, and listening. Um, just before we sign off, uh, I want to let you know that about a week ago, we hosted our eighth annual fall mining showcase. And if you want to watch the replays live of the 40 presenting companies, uh, just click on the, uh, the link provided and uh, you'll be able to access all of that. So thank you very much and we'll see you all at the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending.